I grow old. I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. Pessimistic? Alienated? Uncomfortably conscious of the passage of time? No, you're not getting old. You're just a modernist. Believe it or not, Thomas Stearns Eliot published The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock at the tender age of 26. And yet, the poem seems to capture a world weariness akin to that of a much older man. Eliot says, It was partly a dramatic creation of a man of about 40, I should say, and partly an expression of feeling of my own through this dim imaginary figure. While today the poem is fondly remembered as a seminal poem that helped usher in American modernism, Prufrock was initially ill-received, with many criticising the poem's themes for being too solipsistic or self-centred and criticising its use of language, style and form as ugly and unconventional. But today we can see it embodying the hallmarks of modernist poetry. So, what makes it modern? By the time you watch this video, you'll have already looked closely at the historical context and values of modernism. So firstly in this video, we'll track the development of the poem's central themes while connecting them to modernist ideas. And secondly, about 10 minutes in, we'll take a look at Eliot's use of language, style and form and how he answers Ezra Pound's call to make it new. I'd strongly suggest you have your copy of the poem in front of you and a sheet of paper to make notes and hit pause as often as you like to note down anything of interest or annotate your poem. Lastly, keep in mind, this is the Miss Lester reading of the poem. Your job in Module B is to develop a personal response. So take what you like from this video, but always remember to supplement these resources with a variety of critical readings, discussion and reflection. So, to the poem's themes, the modernists, like the romantics, were critical of the rapidly industrialising world in its ability to satisfy innate human desires. However, the modernists avoided indulging in images of nature and romantic love, instead documenting the discomfort they felt in the modern world. One way of looking at the central thesis of Prufrock could be summed up thus. The modern world leads to feelings of alienation. Alienation leads to paralysis, to an inability to take action and make decisions. Paralysis leads to inertia. We are trapped, both in the modern world and in our own paralysing intellectual and emotional responses to it. Because of this, we resort to living in our imagination. You might want to take a second to write these four ideas down. We'll be tracking their development throughout the poem. Remember, these aren't the only ideas in the poem, so don't forget to familiarise yourself with a few others via the canvas page and your own research. Alienation isn't that romantic, so why call it a love song? Langdon Hammer suggests that the poem is a new kind of love song for the modern era, that rather than articulating longing in the bald-faced manner of the romantics, Prufrock intellectualises longing. He speaks instead of the desire to express oneself frankly, perhaps to someone we desire sexually, but being paralysed by the fear of being misinterpreted or rejected. Consider a literal translation of the poem's epigraph, taken from Dante's The Divine Comedy. I'll only tell you my thoughts because we are in hell. And, as nobody leaves hell, I do not fear that you will repeat my stories to others. Thus, the social conditions of the world we live in, the need to save face, prevent us from presenting an authentic version of ourselves, something we're reminded of today every time we open Instagram. While the poem's opening is confident and imperative, let us go then, you and I, the speaker seems never to progress or move forward, walking only streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent. There is significant debate among scholars as to whether Prufrock actually ever leaves his room, given the disappointment and frustration he appears to associate with the world beyond it. It's restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Certainly, the opening stanza simile of a patient etherized upon a table seems to suggest inertia. Following this, we have the first instance of the repeated couplet, in the room the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. 
the bathos or anticlimax created by this couplet suggests meaningless, trivial interactions that happen around Prufrock. He sits and watches the passing parade, alienated while others move and converse without him. Now, take a look at the poem's next stanza, from the yellow fog to the bottom of the page. What animal is evoked through zoomorphism? And what characteristics of this animal might help further these ideas of inertia or a lack of movement? Does Prufrock ever leave the house? Hit pause and annotate your poem with these ideas in mind. So you probably noticed the cat. Keep an eye out for him again in Rhapsody on a Windy Night. But you'll have also noticed that the cat is only ever described in parts, never as a whole. The same can be said of the other human figures beyond Prufrock that weave their way in and out of the poem. Prufrock's sense of alienation in the modern world is heightened in the following stanza as he describes through synecdoche, hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Indeed, the trivial social interactions that Prufrock engages in are reduced through synecdoche to the taking of a toast and tea. The effect of this is to detach Prufrock from the modern world that surrounds him. This was a fairly common trope of modernist poetry and literature, described by Charles Baudelaire and later Walter Benjamin as the flaneur, a wanderer of the streets of the modern metropolis, a keen observer of his surroundings, but never a part of them. Indeed, Prufrock the flaneur fears being viewed in the same reductive manner that he views his own surroundings. He worries... They will say how his hair is growing thin. The Flaneur obsession with fashion and being seen reveals itself in the following lines. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin. Evidently, as much as the modern Flaneur sees himself as coolly detached from his surroundings, he inevitably succumbs to the desire to be viewed as attractive and alluring by the very people he looks down upon. The modern flaneur is a character of contradiction, and Prufrock is no exception. Consider the rhetorical question, do I dare disturb the universe, which reveals his indecision at daring to be different. Yet he talks about his world as though it is trivial and predictable, as though he is above all of it, in the confident declarative statement, for I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. So take a look at these three stanzas, from the line you just heard, line 49, to the five dots halfway down the next page, just before line 70. How many confident declarative statements of this nature can you find? How many rhetorical questions? What is the effect of having them side by side? Hit pause, annotate your poem, and make some notes. You'll have noticed some sexual overtones in lines such as, is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? The same year that Prufrock was published, Eliot confided in a friend from Harvard that he had been suffering what he described as a nervous sexual attack brought on by big modern cities such as Paris. He wrote, One walks about the street with one's desires and one's refinement rises up like a wall whenever opportunity approaches. So we see this notion of alienation fueling paralysis and bringing about inertia in Eliot's struggles initiating sexual encounters. And of course, when we are paralysed, when we are inert, we are forced to live out our deepest desires in our imagination. A tone of conjecture, of an imagined alternate reality, characterises much of the next few stanzas. Shall I say, I should have been, should I after tea and cakes and ices. And only in this imagined world does Eliot have the courage to bite off the matter with a smile, to squeeze the universe into a ball. Much like their romantic predecessors, the modernists had a tendency to indulge in the imagined world. Yet, unlike the romantics, the modernist imagination was tinged with pessimism. The object of Prufrock's desire, while settling a pillow by her head, responds, that is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. To complement this idea of living in the imagined world, Eliot implies that the real world is something of a performance. Consider the references to Shakespeare's Hamlet in lines 111 to 119. Using the play as a metaphor, he invokes the existentialist idea that maybe we're not the heroes of our own story. Rather than being Prince Hamlet meant to be, with a mission and a purpose, he is 
almost at times the fool, a forgettable side character. For a recap on existentialism, check out this video here and the resources on Canvas. Consider the mythical images in the final stanzas of the poem. From line 124 onwards, Eliot invokes dreamlike images of mermaids and sirens singing. We're certainly in the world of the imagination, and yet he still does not think that they will sing to him. Even the imagination does not provide a total escape from the alienation of modernity. To summarise, the modern world is alienating because of its social expectations. This paralyses us and leaves us inert, unable to move forward for fear of making a wrong decision. Even in the world of our imagination, where we can escape this paralysis, our fears of rejection continue to manifest themselves. Pretty bleak. With an understanding of the key ideas in the poem, we now turn to the ways that Eliot uses language, style and form to express these ideas and how these choices reflect modernism. In particular, we'll unpack the use of verse libre and stream of consciousness. These two elements work nicely together to support the poem's function as a dramatic monologue, a text where a speaker reveals their innermost thoughts and feelings to a presumed listener. So, what are verse libre and stream of consciousness? Well, Eliot wrote in 1945, a poet must take as his material his own language as it is actually spoken around him. Combine this with Ezra Pound's imperative to make it new, and these modernist philosophies give birth to verse libre as a stylistic technique. Verse libre describes a style of poetry that does not follow strict limitations in rhyme and metre. Consider the first stanza of romantic poet Wordsworth's I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. The use of a strict rhyming scheme, in this instance ABAB and metre, iambic tetrameter, were characteristic of romantic poetry. Now compare this to the opening stanza of Proofrock. Is there a rhyming scheme? Is there meter? Compared to Wordsworth, in what ways does Proofrock's opening stanza better reflect language as it is actually spoken around us as Eliot desired? Hit pause, make some annotations and some notes if you wish. You'll have noticed there isn't a total absence of rhyme and meter. Eliot insisted that rhyme and metre be used sparingly in carefully chosen places for emphasis. Consider the rhyming couplet in iambic pentameter that concludes the poem. By sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown, till human voices wake us and we drown. There's a steadiness to the rhyme and metre of the final two stanzas of the poem, of Prufrock's escape into the world of the imagination. Even if it isn't a total escape from modernity, is there perhaps something calming and steady about the imagined world? Frequently hand in hand with verse libre is the notion of stream of consciousness, a means of organising or not organising ideas in your writing. While romantics would tend to focus on building towards a single idea in their work, and again you might want to look up the Wordsworth poem for comparison, the stream of consciousness style jumps rapidly from idea to idea. Consider the way ideas in Proofrock emerge and are never returned to, like the cat in stanza two. In fact, early potential publishers of Proofrock advocated for the removal of the Prince Hamlet stanza because it seems so disconnected from other ideas in the poem. That isn't to say though that Proofrock lacks purpose or a central thesis. Hopefully the first 10 minutes of this video weren't a total waste in that regard. If anything, the modernists believe that a stream of consciousness approach better revealed the speaker's state of mind. Consider the anxiety of the character of Prufrock. When we're anxious, we oscillate wildly between thoughts and states of mind, between reality and our imagination. If poetry is then to be an authentic representation of the human mind, why should it be organised logically if the human mind is not? For another good example of stream of consciousness, take a look at Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf, another proponent of the modernist movement who also explored issues of mental health and the human psyche in her work. Now let's consider the way that some of Eliot's choices in syntax support his choices in style and form. Have a look at line 40, which ends in an M dash, suggesting an interruption of thought, and consider how this is followed by his anxieties in parentheses. Fancy word for brackets. Prufrock's thoughts seem to interrupt and tumble over one another, 
and often his darkest or most anxious thoughts appear in brackets as interjections into other thoughts. For instance, the highly intimate line 64, but in the lamplight downed with light brown hair, and the deeply insecure line 82, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald. Indeed, punctuations such as semicolons, ellipsis, colons and dashes are used haphazardly throughout the piece to create a disjointed feel to Prufrock's thoughts, as is enjambment or sentences that spill across multiple lines. For your last exercise, take another read over the poem and find one example of each of the following. A semicolon, an ellipsis, a colon, a dash and a line using enjambment. Annotate each one with the effect it creates and consider how it adds to the feelings of anxiety in the poem. Ultimately, language, style and form are used by Eliot to stir within the reader the modernist anxiety that Prufrock so acutely feels, that we are alone in the modern world. And as long as we continue to overthink our interactions with others, we paralyse ourselves and doom ourselves to eternal loneliness. So thank you for making it this far, Year 12. Hopefully you found something useful to support your reading of the poem. And remember that in Module B, it's all about your interpretation. So don't forget to supplement your viewing of this video with plenty of critical readings, rich discussions with your peers, and your own reflections on your intellectual and emotional responses to T.S. Eliot's marvellous modernist poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock.